Bueno, eh, buen día a todas, a so todos. So, good morning, all of you, following us from Latin America, Asia, Africa, in this seminar of uh, Venezuela in struggle at, of uh, community regeneration. As we have just published in an article available in Spanish and very soon in English and in Mandarin, we are entering the last leg of this seminar. This is the 16th session. This is called the Long March Towards Communal Society. This will kickstart uh, analysis with uh, Iraida Vargas and Mario Sanoja in order to analyze uh, the thesis they have developed on the historical origins of communal the processes in Venezuela. And then we start analyzing, analyzing the economic processes of Venezuela, the theoretical reference to understand the Venezuelan process, and also an overview of the colonial history in order then to analyze the current situation and the main risks and contradictions and be able to analyze some challenges. So that uh, part of the analysis will be shared with Jose Feliz Rivas Alvarado. We have the link of the previous 15th sessions. They are online for those wishing to review those. Also, before starting today's session, well, yesterday there was uh, a meeting yesterday with the um, President of the Republic and Minister of the Communes, as we have uh, discussed over the last month since October. Well, in Venezuela, the communal process has been uh, encouraged and embraced by the Bolivarian Revolution. Therefore, in the same manner, we have a legal framework for this commune policy. This has been evolving. There was an invitation to create communal cities. The idea was to create at least 200 communal cities in Venezuela. Yesterday, President Maduro and the Minister of Communes, Noris Herrera, they took stock of the process of creation of communal cities in Venezuela. They mentioned some projects of creation, these communal cities, close to 250 communal cities. Another information provided by the President of the Republic yesterday was that uh, 4,200 communes active today with 27,000 communal councils linked to those uh, communes. So the architecture of the construction of the communal state in Venezuela has gone through the process of commingling several um, communal councils within communes and uh, cities. So. 4,200 uh, communes based on 27,000 communal councils. So these are some data that could be useful. In the meantime, we've been receiving some messages from the world and Venezuela. So today, as I already mentioned, we have the privilege to share with Iraida Vargas and Mario Sanoja they are anthropologists and they have been working in various analysis in of archaeological reconstruction of Venezuelan history. And we need to mention what they have uh, worked on to understand the creation of, of the Venezuelan society. We need to bear in mind some titles. The book 
on water and power, where they analyze the creation of Caracas based on the water sources. The relation with water is a key element in the creation of power relations in Caracas of uh, 1800s and uh, how it uh, evolved into the current capital. And then Iraida Vargas, she has a book on resistance and participation. And there she analyzes the main popular struggles in Venezuela and uh, how they have been essential for the creation of the Venezuela society through participation, struggle in the creation of uh, and, and, and the confrontation with the creation of the right uh, hegemonic bloc. Mario Sanoja, he has written a book which is of the essence on the, the social, cultural, economic creation of Venezuela. And there he analyzes the Venezuelan civilization starting with the pre-Columbian period and then goes on the various stages until the, the Republic is created and also analyzing the current civilization. And each one of the, the periods we then can analyze the, the structuring of Venezuelan economy. And last, we have a book that is a reference book, namely the long march towards uh, communal society. That's the thesis, namely how communal processes have been, evol have been evolving in Venezuela since a long time, and, uh, and it has been essential in the various struggles in Venezuela. And over time, it's been commingling in Venezuelan society, and it marks the beginning of the construction process of the communal path to build a Bolivarian socialist process. I'm not going to give uh, any further details on these uh, analysis. I just want to give the floor to professors Iraida and Mario Sanoja could uh, then intervene. So, Jared, do you want to make any introduction before we give the floor to the professors? Um, no, thank you. Yeah. All right. So, Professor, you have the floor. Good morning. I'm still waiting for my wife, but... Uh, I will have to start with a brief introduction. For a long time, we've been working with the Venezuelan original societies, peasant societies. One of the things that struck us in this long journey the time and space is that in the 60s we still had peasant communities whose communal structure was very clear and they were very close to large cities this means that that was not a mere accident but rather as a social trait that existed for a long time. Later on, one of our students that uh, recently died, he conducted a research on the pre-Hispanic communities in the Lara state, Northeast Venezuela, 
some zones occupied by indigenous populations from the Kaketiers ethnic group, a very much developed in the 16th century. They even covered the state with agriculture, watering systems, and a very proto-urban proposal, very interesting. Based on that research, we were able to establish a link to what we are founding, finding in the 20th century, namely that many Venezuelan peasant societies still preserved the original communi communal traits in a different manner, in a different context, but the communal character of life was preserved. This is very useful because when socialism started to be discussed in Venezuela under Chavez, we wanted to present a thesis namely that socialism is not an ideology imposed on peoples. Socialism, rather, is a historical phase in the history of peoples, and it has to be understood by understanding the history of those peoples. The Venezuelan socialism, therefore, had to adapt to our characteristics, our original characteristics. This is not new. Good morning, Professor Iraida Vargas has just arrived. Welcome, Professor. Bueno, este, eso, eso fue una, una de las tesis que nosotros manejamos. So, that was one of the theses we proposed, namely that socialism should be adapted to the characteristics of societies where it was uh, developed. And uh, by doing so, socialism could work. In our case, as I mentioned, communes were not new in Venezuelan society. Rather, it was a constant. By studying urban societies, in the 30s of last century, we witnessed a migration from the rural areas to the urban areas. And that ended up in the creation of cities as Caracas, where all of a sudden received large waves of uh, poor people that uh, built neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods surrounding the cities. These human groups coming from the rural areas, those peasants, they created then this uh, shanty towns, and in those shanty towns, they created vast communal systems. And with a very peculiar culture, 
and we think that that is one of the historical components that uh, could be the seed of the urban communal systems in Venezuela. When we talk about the long march, we refer to the term used by Mao, but also we refer to the fact that the communal history started with ancient cultures up until now. And that is precisely what we've tried to discuss. Mario told me that you are interested in knowing how we wrote this book, The Long March Towards a Communal Society. And not only this book, but many other works, even before Chavez stated the famous phrase, commune or nothing. Since Mario and I met, well, as we know, we are anthropologists, uh, ethnologists. We graduated from the UCV and uh, those who founded the anthropologist school and sociologist school that was in a single school. Their vision of anthropology that it was made up by branches. That was their approach. And among the branches of anthropology, we had uh, archaeology, archaeology. And since both of us, we wanted to understand historical processes. That was our main interest. So we as both studied archaeologists, archaeology. We studied here and abroad in various countries. So those studies led us to the practice of anthropology and to be familiar with realities that some people ignore. For instance, anthropologists didn't know about the information archaeologists had and so on. Same thing in other social disciplines. They, they, they did not the profound, the in-depth history of Venezuela. However, archaeologists, since we had to do field work in the remote corners, was very helpful. My contact with peasants was the result of this field work. And when I talk about peasants, I'm not talking about the nice, pleasant, peasant uh, life. Those campesinos, peasants, were living in terrible oppression conditions that was not very different from the colonial times. Those peasants were totally abandoned, oppressed, exploited. And I say this because Many sociologists, did they know about the oppression of those peasants? So archaeologists, such as us, and those who work in this area had this information firsthand. When I was attending school with marvelous professors, like Pedro Figueroa, Sacosta Sain, and Rodolfo Quintero, when we were in our class, we could understand 
the shanty towns, the urban life we could share. But when we were in the field, we can then learn about the oppressed Venezuelans, abandoned, uh, left behind. So that field work allowed us to have a vision of what the Venezuelan people was. It was not the Coney Island in Caracas, where the nascent bourgeoisie, very powerful at that time, used to go to have fun, but uh, the true Venezuelan spirit and feeling was beyond the urban areas. And uh, in those areas that were totally abandoned, oppressed, and exploited. I remember in 1959, the, during the, an election campaign, where Betancourt won of one of the elections, or Leoni later on, they considered that Venezuelans were all, only those living in the urban areas, in the cities, those who were forced forced to migrate from the rural areas, they didn't consider that those people had so much knowledge. They were people with uh, very sensitive and were able to communicate in the rural areas through the communes, because if in the rural areas you lack uh, solidarity among the different peoples living there, and then if you lack solidarity in the shanty towns, well, you were doomed to demise. So Betancourt, a very uh, cunning, politician, he used to talk about the land reform, and uh, that was one of the main proposals to attract votes during that period where so many uh, tricks were used to win elections. So they proposed many times that land reforms was going to be a reality, that they were going to distribute land among the peasants and campesinos, and they were able to create a the rural middle class, and that those people were going to enjoy uh, the ownership of the land and uh, agricultural um, inputs and so on. But it, it didn't happen didn't happen. They, that was a trick to win elections. And that trick was used to, uh, every five years uh, during elections. And the landowners were, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the members of the various uh, political parties ruling society. So uh, peasants ended up uh, in a constant and uh, perpetuating uh, poverty. When Pe Jimenez, the dictator, carried out the coup, it was in 1959, when we, in the end, in the streets, and through the struggle and led by various uh, very important leaders. I, I forget some of the names, but uh, it was through the struggle in the streets that uh, the uh, struggle in order to overcome the uh, disaster that was occurring in the country. And then, La Razabal 
a military officer joined the government uh, junta that was uh, installed after deposing um, the dictator Pere Jiménez, and they implement a special plan A, a plan of special works. The peasants then continue to migrate to big cities in the quest for jobs, schools, because illiteracy was rampant in the rural areas. Now, as who used to visit them through our field work as archaeologists, I can tell you very proudly that in 1966-67, I knew from Castillete to Paria and from Caracas to the Amazon, I had visited the whole country, the mountains, the coast area, the plains, because this was not an empty territory when the Spaniards arrived. There were people here and an extraordinary creative people with great achievements and a vast knowledge of the territory. And without those people, the original populations, without them, there would have been no invasion because the invaders didn't know the territory and it was our original population who helped them to know the territory. So the Spanish invaders were guided by the local population and informed about our wealth. So all the history that Mario and I have studied, and I'm just telling you very briefly about our work. We have published several books, one that we published in the 60s, which is named Ancient production methods in Venezuela. And also we have been publishing other titles, updating the available data. And one of the books that we have published is this one that I wrote in the 90s, Archaeology, Science and Society, which was published here in Caracas. And his work, I described why Venezuelans are the way they are, why campesinos are the way they are. And uh, we also dis described how they settled in the territories, how they produced the land, what were their ways of living, and um, it is uh, something that has not remained in the past because uh, it is also relevant today. And this is the purpose of history to understand our present. We need to understand the past and also to be familiar with the positive things and not only the positive things, but also the negative circumstances, how to understand problems, why these problems arise in the contemporary Venezuela, with the participation, of course, of several scientists. We have been looking at this and uh, trying to understand the lay person. And by all these, I mean, that we realized 
that when we were listening, for instance, to a, a speech by a political leader of uh, the Democratic Party or of a left-wing party, when we were listening to what they were saying in terms of them taking care of the population, taking care of peasants, well, we realized that in the places that we had visited with populations over the years, we knew that what they were saying was just a lie. There was never an agrarian reform. Only with the arrival of President Chavez and the arrival of the revolution, we started to dismantle latifundism. Up to that moment, the landowners were also the politicians. The people in charge of the national politics. So I felt it was our duty as uh, scientists, not only to look at this reality in order for us to understand the facts, but to, to be able to fully understand this reality and to explain it to the national society. Mario studied in the 50s as myself. I finished my studies at 50s, at the beginning of the 60s. That was a very particular moment in history. We could realize or we could understand rather why people emigrated from the inner cities to the major cities just to create uh, um, more misery. And this was not only the case uh, in Venezuela, this was the case in Latin America. We did not understand why peasants abandoned the fields and uh, took uh, up to the, to the cities to live under such terrible conditions because they were extremely poor and these populations were living in a miserable conditions. So we understand, we understood rather that we needed to understand all the processes that they went through when they were in the inner cities, when they were working the land, what kind of uh, values, what kind of knowledge they had. And I remember once I was in the Lago de Maracaibo region, we were talking to a woman and she explained to me how she was knitting, knitting using the different vegetables, fibers of the vegetables, knitting with the, those uh, vegetables. And I asked her, how do you know this? And then she answered, no, I don't know anything. You are the one who have, has uh, all that knowledge. You are the scientist. And what I mean by this is that I became familiar with a reality that had been hidden by the authorities, all authorities, starting from the colonial times up to the present time. The fact is that peasants, the campesinos, the workers of the land, they had a very bad self-image that had been inculcated from the times, from the colonial times. There is an excellent book. I don't remember the name, forgive me, because I cannot remember the title of that book. But anyway, Vladimir Acosta, 
a writer. He published a book where he shows all the, the, the how bad the self-image of the peasants and campesinos uh, uh, was and uh, adjectives. He named a list of adjectives that were used to qualify the Aboriginal populations. But not only that, I remember also that um, people used to say, you know, common people used to say that Aboriginal populations were ignorant. They didn't know how to write or to read, that they were, uh, they were very bad adjectives used against them. But that perception continued up till the moment President Chavez started to change the narrative and many other before him also tried to change the narrative but president chavez was the one who changed that narrative and that we needed to feel proud of ourselves and uh, many people back then tried to uh, be similar to the bourgeoisie and to um, and to have a very low esteem for the Aboriginal populations. This is the way uh, the bourgeoisie was uh, behaving. But uh, President Chavez told us about change of this perception and starting recognizing the values of the Aboriginal populations. So thanks to the, the, the training that in the case of Mario and I had due to our scientist um, background, also thanks to the work of many other scientists that I, Professor Farias, Professor Marco Savala, many other professors of the scholar life, we started uh, inculcating a different kind of a perception to the uh, to students and the universities to change this perception. But when President Chavez arrived to the presidency, he delivered a wonderful speech and he said that we needed to create a popular power. What did this mean? Well, we needed to create popular power, not from the scholar point of view, but the people had to be convinced that the only way in which they could have power to make their voices heard was through organization, to recognizing the formidable struggles of the middle class of the Venezuelan people. Through the creation of popular power. This didn't mean that uh, people were going just to start working from nothing. No, people who were already working ever since centuries ago. And I stress this, we are not a young people. This is, a, our people have uh, existed from 14,500 years ago. And uh, over this time, we have learned a lot. Our ancestors were very diverse and they socialized their ways of life. So this is the reason why through our studies, we have been able to detect how important agriculture was for the population. And this is the case in 
different settlements around the country and the Indian region in the plains or in the state of Monaga, Sucre, etc. All over the territory. So this kind of research made it possible for us to understand that the peasants were very creative. And they have been creative uh, from centuries ago. They produced extraordinary creations, such as the domestication of the space, agricultural production, the creation of uh, housing, because they were very creative indeed, although many people believe that they did were ignorant and did not have any kind of culture, but it is impossible to live without culture. They had a kind of culture that uh, was not very well known. And um, of course, this was uh, the case. I mean, many people did not understand the culture of the peasants. And this was popular culture. But when we talk about culture, we talk about what we all have. We do not have a different kinds of culture. We have only one single culture. But some people believe that, believe that culture is just about going to the opera, going to fancy shows, etc., And that popular culture had nothing to do with that. Popular culture, as Antonio Gramsci used to say, he used to say that folklore was a kind of uh, an art that was foreign to the elites, an art that was useful, an art that uh, just copied it but did not really could be that could not really couldn't be classified as real art as real culture but uh, well no culture belongs to everyone i believe that the great human in invention the grand invention of humanity to settle in the space and to produce has been the creation of the communal life. Communal life is just not uh, a group of people working together because they are sharing the same space. No, the creation of communal life and uh, from here comes the expression communal nothing used by Chavez is uh, in order to live in a community and to establish a commune, you need to live in a community sharing the common things that all the members of that community have, all the things that they share. This is what a commune is, is the union, the, the unity that has to prevail so life can uh, continue its course based on cooperation, solidarity, acknowledging the existence of the other, respecting differences. I would say that communal life is the life that we all want to have sharing the values and the principles that we are trying to build in order to achieve the socialism, a Bolivarian socialism. The first ways of social configuration were, as I said, commune, communes, communitary life, and a single important difference is the gender Difference, difference. Engels used to say that uh, 
dic discrimination and domination of women is the most important historical domination and the origin of all the rest of uh, the discriminations. So, this is how patriarchy has started, actually, that continued prevailing until the struggles uh, emerged against uh, patriarchy. Well, this is uh, more or less how we have ended up systemizing and analyzing all our research. I would propose now for those who want to understand our condition, not only to read the book of La Garia Marca or the other titles I have mentioned, or there's a book on the rentier society and Bolivarian socialism. In these books, you will find very valuable information of all the history that we have been telling you. You can find it here in this book, from the rentier society to Bolivarian communal socialism. The prologue, prologue was written by Pasqualina Curso. And the title that we chose of, of, for this book is due to the fact that uh, all through the process that the Venezuelan people have been living, oil is an important uh, element of the equation with oil where well i wouldn't say that with oil process it started in the 17th century but uh, when the oil emerged into our reality a year society started and this had uh, this gave a way to the creation of the oil culture and people started practicing counter values and people started showing behaviors that were very selfish and um, we lost our identity in a way there was a denationalization of the social processes and phenomena in the different realms. Figueroa wrote how the ways of creation and economy were disrupted and also in the books of Acosta Sainz and the books of Quintero, he, they explained very clearly what were the counter values that emerged after the oil discovery, the denationalization of the social processes. And why people started losing their identity with Venezuela to the point to, to push many of the young people to leave the country, to go, abroad. But uh, it is important uh, to pinpoint, pinpoint that there is no society without a culture. It's impossible. When we look at the rectier society, the way it looks live, well, we understand that the thinking of the society was mainly um, a thinking that uh, gave, gave priority to the creation of capital produced by the oil rentier culture. And these behaviors are devoid of culture. Now, what is culture? Culture is a way to see life, to understand your customs, to understand your traditions, and to respect those traditions. So this is the reason why 
the culture of a society needs to be respected and preserved because this is what uh, makes people uh, feel that they belong to one 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 single country i remember when uh, i was working with the tourism ministry and uh, there was a, a discussion there that was a very short discussion and not very true truthful on a uh, typical dish in venezuela called arepa arepa is um, it's like uh, bread made of corn that venezuelans eat and they they were saying that arepa was not uh, a, a dish originally from venezuela but from colombia and um, many of the territories where corn is produced well they also cultivated corn not only in the venezuelan territory but in the colombian territory but in colombia at the beginning of the, the 20th century when the territorial struggles started well i don't want to go into detail to that history but anyway the cultural characteristics that are present in our food our food is uh, of course uh, also tantamount to what kind of culture we have so corn being used to produce arepas is not necessarily the same in case in other countries such as mexico in mexico they eat tortillas tortillas and tacos also produced uh, uh, using corn but they don't eat arepas as venezuelans do or they don't eat cachapas cachapas are like a tortilla but uh, it's a it's a different kind of tortilla. Uh, Gachapa is more like a pancake, a pancake that you 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 make uh, with uh, corn flour. So it's not like a bread actually. You eat cachapas with other foods like uh, cheese. Well, all these dishes are made out of corn, but corn was domesticated in specific locations of uh, the Venezuelan uh, territory and also the American continent. And other countries such as Mexico and Central America as well. Guatemala, Nicaragua, from Mexico to Nicaragua all Central America. But when we come here to Latin America, we could see that the culinary traditions were present in Colombia, in Venezuela, and other countries like Mexico as well, and in Peru. So not because we all produce corn, we can say that we have exactly the same culinary traditions. And I also remember another, allow me to share with you another anecdote. In the scholar um, world, you can have very nice discussions indeed. And uh, a group of scholars of Latin America, we were discussing about uh, the consumption of corn, the consumption of avocado that comes from Central America and the Southern Latin Americans, um, Bolivians, Peruvians, they were telling, they were saying that that was not avocado, but palta. They changed the name that uh, Palta was better than avocados. Well, it was a very funny discussion indeed. 
and um, of course what this means is that uh, you identify with the food of your region and the consumption of the vegetables that you uh, grow in your region right uh, corn or avocado and uh, we were discussing about which type of corn or which type of avocado was uh, better Excuse me, I didn't know that there was a translation and uh, that we needed to make clarifications, but avocado is a particular kind of avocado being grown in um, Venezuela and other countries. And palta is a word that comes from a ethnic group that I cannot remember right now. I'm sorry, I apologize. The Quechua, from the Quechua, it's a Quechua, palta, it's a Quechua word. Que, palta, it's like pepper. And uh, this, Fruit was introduced by the different movements that took place in, in the invasions of the Latin American continent, but in uh, Central America, from Mexico to Panama, there was, uh, they use other names like Chile. So this was just to tell you that these were very amusing discussions about what is best, if chili or if avocado or palta or the chili coming from Cuba, anyway, or different varieties of pepper that are grown in Latin America. But what this shows us that uh, we can characterize not only the different cultures existing in these countries, right? And also the level of uh, connection that these peoples had among themselves participating in the cultural process of other other people but it also allows us to understand why there are some it, the communal existing ways in the contemporary society For us, to talk about communal, communal life is to talk about socialism. First, to talk about popular power, of course, and then talk about socialism. Popular power. has been described by excellent works written by social researchers. And they recognize that the only way in which socialist, to, to produce socialist ways of life is to work from the indigenous, indigenous processes from the bottom up. In this book, in the long march towards the com communal society, we describe the Bolivarian socialism. And is uh, in the subtitle, you can probably read, thesis on the Bolivarian socialism. That is the subtitle. 
because for a communal society to exist or for social communal ways of life you need to have socialism where people can share with each with other people that they are not competing such is the case with capitalism where one group dominates over another group no you need to have an egalitarian society where solidarity prevails in order to lead your life where you acknowledge the differences as a, a source of opportunities and not a source of problems because no one needs to be exactly like someone else so the relationship among social groups need to be respectful of the different ways in which uh, different social groups conceive life okay so the need there needs to be respect and so on and so forth the, because the way culture is produced and reproduced is not homogeneous i remember having read and heard my professors say that indigenous original people were they were people whose condition of civilized was denied they were considered savages because they had not created uh, institutions that were considered uh, civilized. Not only that is not true. And because the Europeans considered civilized institutions that didn't exist for the original populations. However, since history is written by the victor. The victor said that the only way to be civilized was to have a king, to have a feudal lord with slaves, with unlimited resources. What happened before the 16th century and then after that, So for them, that was civilization. Our original populations that exist even today, they were no savages. And they were not savages then, and they are no savages today. And even though today, Today, the civilizations have changed. They, they remain very civilized. They, they, they are no savages. We could say even that uh, our Carib populations were very much civilized because they created so many things. Regarding the contribution made by Commander Chavez to create the communal society, the main contribution was to give the people that have been marginalized by the bourgeois to give them power, to empower them. One element of Chavez's thought was to give power to the power to the people. That people started to become an agent of power with Chavez. 
those living in total poverty, marginalized, they become aware that the only way to truly leave behind poverty was to organize and to struggle as a counter-hegemonic power opposed to the power of the bourgeoisie and capitalism. That uh, phrase of Chavez, only the people can save the people, he was expressing out loud what I have thought always as an anthropologist. I remember arriving in a place and seeing the behavior of people. And I could see them in their own towns. And I could see how they live, how they love, how they relate to each other. And when I saw that, I wondered how I'm here to teach these people. These people have already a culture. So I was there just to looking for archaeological remains. And I told myself, why should I give these people a new culture? Why should I give them the possibility to read and write? Why should I tell them what to eat or not? Why should I tell them how to erect their houses? What should I tell them about the way the children play in natural yards? I mean, I, I was wondering, I do not have the authority to tell them how to live. So there was a cultural shock. I was coming from a society where a 10 year old child was already at school. A 10 year old boy or girl couldn't play or do things as those children uh, in the rural areas. So we need to respect other people's culture. Well, they do not know how to write and read, okay? But our children in the urban areas, they do not know how to cross streets if you do not lead them because they don't know how to protect themselves. They are not sufficiently alert as those kids in the rural areas. So in the phrase, only the people could save the people means people should know what are the deficiencies, what are the needs. Once the people recognize the needs, the peasants, the indigenous people from any other part of our geography, if they feel that they need another type of communication with the rest of the of society, if they deem it a necessity, if they need to read and write, or that they need to eat in a different manner, or if they need different furnitures. But they have to tell that, they have to say it. Up to them to decide, because they are the creator of their culture. So in that case, 
the the slogan of, of Chavez that only the people can save the people is telling the people that they know what they need and what are what are the what is the hierarchy of needs those groups they know how they can unite and what are the values that unite them i remember when chavez said only the people can save the people and uh, when he delivered those speeches that i'm not myself i am i am the people you are chavez the woman is chavez people are chavez what do they mean that we need to open the communication networks so there will be an understanding of the needs and the needs differ the respect of diversity, the respect of difference, and the verb save, that you are saved so others do not overrun you, that society does not impose on you things that you do not aspire to. I do not know if uh, and Mario would like to elaborate on this. When we talk about the, the people's power, which is the capacity to organize yourself, in the communal councils today, They are a mechanism of uh, self-management in direct contact with the communities. So to understand the communal councils and the communes, we need to understand that it is the power of collective to recognize the needs, the dreams, their aspirations, and to transform it into a the social movement. That uh, takes the form of a communal council or a commune. But uh, in the last resort is a process of uh, self-management in the community. And of course, it uh, enters in the contradiction to the bourgeois society and the way it organizes. It is in contradiction to the, the existing bourgeois system. There is an Argentinian author that has worked a lot in this field. I have to remember her name. Isabel Rauer. Rauber. Well, she says that the, the people's power, people's organization should come from the bottom to the top, but Western society tends to say, well, we need to teach them, teach them this and that, as if the rest of the people are ignorant. We need to recognize that people have their own value system. They have their culture. They have values they respect values that could uh, enrich us. And uh, 
us as Westerners. And I say Westerner because I was raised according to the Western values. But the good thing is that somehow the traditional peasant societies, the, the urban poor communities, they merged with other forms of socialization. Like for instance, you have to learn to write and read because if you do not, you will be handicapped, which is true. But you don't only have to, not only have to learn to read and write, but, not, but you have to learn how to consume. You have to consume in this and that fashion. I remember Chavez when he taught us about the system of values. We have devoted a lot of time to study this because the value system, which are the cornerstone of uh, collective subjectivity, they tell us that we are all equal. Therefore, there are no hierarchy based on inequalities. Inequalities that we find a lot in the Western societies. The value system is the one telling you, you shouldn't rob. When I met Evo Morales, in the Hilton Hotel, the network of uh, intellectuals had the privilege of having him sitting next to me. I remember talking to him and he's, he told me that, uh, he told me how Chavez always speak about love. And he said that uh, uh, the Andean population were people attracted to love, but we didn't love in the same fashion as Chavez used to talk about love. And it is related also to religions. Christ, for instance, used to say, love each other as I love you. So love is no doubt one of the main values in a society, especially in communal societies because communities appear because uh, we want to be equal, we want to build societies with behaviors which are different from the culture of exploitation, domination, this union that uh, characterize uh, capitalist societies. I would like to add, for giving the floor, to those wishing to ask uh, questions. One of the ways to understand the Bolivarian socialism is precisely this. Most of the examples regarding the construction of socialism have to do with uh, vertical action. The state is essential to the creation of socialism. In the Venezuelan case, in the Bolivarian case, the communal socialism 
is a collective, vast movement. that is active participating in devising communal policies. There is a people's power that is developed, and this power is actively participating in devising our legal base, juridical framework. For instance, currently there is an important debate led by the President of the Republic, since he has introduced a number of uh, acts on uh, commune and communal cities. And this is precisely the result of uh, the creativity of the political system. In Venezuela, we have a mechanism of consultation enabling a decision-making process which is shared between the central state and the communes. So these new laws proposed that has to do with the change in the structure of the Venezuelan society, they uh, result from the action of the popular power and how they participate actively in changing our system. And uh, before giving the floor to the participants, we need to say that uh, it's not only with Chavez that these debates uh, appear. Even before, And then we recognize Chavez bef because before Chavez, there is a popular aspiration. For instance, if you analyze what happened to Pedro Jimenez, the dictator of the 50s, he is toppled because of the popular pressure. People force the eviction of the dictator. And the election of Chavez is the result of the people's will because people organized, prepared, and then that resulted in Chavez. And Chavez then stimulates the strengthening of that, po of that power. Since colonial times, we were known in Latin America as consumer people, rich people who love to love to buy and consume. What I mean by this is that the encouragement comes from Chavez, from the beginning of this revolution. And it is, this is one of the characteristics of the Bolivarian communal process, is that um, people are uh, consulted every time there is a draft law, well, people are asked what they think about uh, these new laws. And the, in the class struggle that exists in Venezuela, the bourgeoisie and their representatives, they are the, shocked by this constant presence of the people. For instance, the new educational law that was passed with Chavez 
Well, that led to protests by the bourgeoisie, because the bourgeoisie said that uh, they were brainwashing the students, that, that this was a red law, a socialist law. So with Chavez, people are uh, involved in the drafting of, of laws. And that uh, is not in agreement with the, the positions of uh, the bourgeoisie. And that uh, that led to divisions even within the popular power because some of them consider themselves bourgeois and other parts of the people thought on the contrary that Chavez, that Chavez's ideas were a source of liberation. And the dictum that uh, the people save the people was the recognition of the role of the people to save themselves. If you consider that this or that element is negative to you, well, you need to get organized and then fight the imposition of those uh, ideas or those uh, programs or whatever. Therefore, today, when we are the subject of uh, oppressions by the affected by the blockade imposed by the empire that is affecting us so much. All along these years where we have been suffering because of this blockade, we keep resisting and we keep working to preserve our autonomy and to continue being as Chavez wants us to be, to be independent and sovereign. I wanted to add something that to what Irida said that has to do with the development of the communal society. In the midst of this terrible blockade imposed by the U.S. imperialism and all the political sanctions that they have used to topple the Venezuelan revolution, they have not been successful in anything they have been doing, precisely because the communal structure of society allows the popular power to get organized. And thanks to this organization, people understand in a clear manner what is at stake, what this aggression is all about. Not only they are imposing economic decisions against us, and people can feel the consequences of those sanctions. They understand the impact but uh, the purpose of this organization of the popular power is to understand the reasons of these blockade and to understand also that in order to prevail, to vanquish, we need to get organized and we need to construct, to build a society from the productive point of view and from a social point of view based on this uh, social of power. This was not expected by imperialism when they declared Venezuela as an extraordinary and unusual threat to the internal security of the United States. That blockade that had been imposed was to be precisely the key. So people started to get organized to start creating an autonomous way in the economic and social lives and ideological lives 
a way that has enabled not only us to resist, but uh, to become a political alternative to imperialism and to the empire. I believe that it is um, a little bit complicated and complex to talk about all the communes existing in Venezuela. In Venezuela, there are all kinds of communes. There are peasant communes, industrial communes, urban communes, etc. So it would be really very complex to analyze all of them. But uh, there is one particular commune that stands out. It's a, a commune, an urban commune, located in the neighborhood named 23 de Enero. And they have been developing an urbanism project in a very complex manner. Uh, in this neighborhood, there are mainly peasants that came from the inner cities that settled there. One of the communes that we visited reunited three main circumscriptions. And there were an high number of families gathered around this commune and they restructured all the physical environment that had been originally conceived on the basis of a capitalism needs and oriented only towards uh, the recreation so to speak and they rebuilt a school, a stadium, a library, a TV channel. I mean, they made a total revamping and transformation of all that physical space. And this was a mean thanks to which people could participate in this common work. And at the same, same time, these spaces were being put at the service of the community. In other words, this is a commune that is productive, but it is not productive in terms of industrial um, purposes. It's creative in terms of ideas, and that is very interesting indeed. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, thank you. We have received thousands of questions coming from different sources in the chat box. So I would like to, there are, there are uh, around 15 questions. So would you like me to read all of the questions one by one, or do you want to listen to all the questions and then answer? What would it make, I mean, what would be more convenient for you? Well, Yes, maybe you can read them all. Well, I would like to add, if you can make a pre-classification by, by topic, and then you will ask us in writing. But if not, just let's just read them one by one, okay? Well, there, I, I need to make some comments that I didn't mention at the beginning. Well, we are one day away from the commemoration of uh, March 18th in 1871. This day, the common process in Paris is started, but it, it is important to, to hold this meeting but the two professors to understand the communal process in Venezuela. The other thing I wanted to say to, to you, professors, is that we have 1,600 people who are connected through streaming from China. 
And from the other side, we have 45 people who have been accompanying us through the Zoom connection. People from Ecuador, Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, Canada, and of course, from China. And uh, of course, many who are following us uh, in Venezuela, from Guyana, from Caracas. So just for you to have an idea as to who are the participants in this uh, streaming connection. So according to the suggestion of the professor of uh, classifying the questions, there are some questions that are related to the Venezuelan historical process, a scene from uh, abroad. Other questions are about your personal story, working together as researchers. So I think I will start with the, the questions that are related to the Venezuelan reality. One of the first questions posed was Jimena Gonzalez. She said that she read a sign that I am going to share in the screen, which is uh, what the communers from Merida said in the past. She founded this in a book, but she wanted to us to show you this sign and to ask you if you had knowledge or if you, if you know something about the communers from Merida. I am going to share the screen and to show you what this is about. There you go. Aha. Fíjense, voy a leer la proclama. I am going to read this. The main places of this kingdom tired of suffering the tensions with the bad government of Spain that is oppressing us According to the news, we have decided uh, to free ourselves and to follow a different party to live in a decent manner. We know that this uh, province wants what is best, and uh, this is the reason why we are determined to get united so that we will be invincible. From Peru, we ask for help. Please help us. God save us. This is signed by the communers of Merida in 1781. So this is one, the, one question about this sign that I have just told to you. And there is another question on Venezuela reality that is been asked uh, from Suda Bolivar. And this person wants to know why inhabitants of the southern uh, of Venezuela, and particularly of the Guyana region, are less participatory in the political affairs of the Republic, doesn't have any relation to its past or sociological and anthropological characterization. In fact, our political and governmental authorities are almost never originated in this area. They are usually imported from other states of the country. There are other questions also coming from China. Well, just just a second. Would you like to answer that question or would you like me to read all the questions? Please go on. So I will go on. The first question from China. It was in 1950s and 1960s that you two professors became radicalized. Please tell us more about your personal journey so that we learn more about progressive intellectuals in Venezuela. Second question. Professor Irider mentioned Gramsci. Could you tell us who are some thinkers that inspired you? Third question. Can you tell us the conclusions of your book, The Long March Towards Communal Society? And I think that we will need three more sessions in order to do so. What do you think are the main achievements and obstacles 
of the communal movement in Venezuela now? Then, a fifth question. Do you see a major shift in the cultural values among people who are now involved in the communal movement? Uh, there is a comment here uh, on the pepper, spicy, pe spicy pepper of uh, Lara and Trujillo. And then from China, another question. Professor said Spanish invaders were held and guided around by some local people. Who were these local people? Were they the elite at that time or a minority? Did they share power or benefits with the invaders? And there is another totally different question. Besides from Arepa, what are the names of food Irida mentioned? Aside from Arepa, please tell us other names, the other names of the food you mentioned. And then another question is the following. What theory of origin of indigenous peoples is current among Venezuelan archaeologists? This person is from Canada, Carol. Carol asks, she says, here there is a controversy about the Berinja theory of the people of the Americas. Another question from China. How did the two professors come to know each other? Well, this is actually a love story. This is a question asked uh, from China. Next question. In China, we are young people doing volunteer work in the villages. Can you tell us some stories of you two going to the villages to do research when you were young? And how did the local people interact with you? There is a comment also. The idea of the indigenous peoples living collectively being the basis of the present Chavista movement along the road to modern socialist commune is essential. In Canada, indigenous people retain their communal, communal culture in cities as well, but uh, they are not supported in that tendency, rather the opposite. Inspiring in your view that the indigenous collective life can be the basis of the modern commune in Venezuela. There is another comment from Mexico. Corn is part of our culture. We are men, women, and children coming from corn, the sons of corn. The basic diet is beans, chili, and tortillas. Oh, there was another question. Um, they wanted to know is that uh, in Venezuela, the corn had been domesticated and if, if the growing of corn was different from the one practiced in Mexico and Central America. And also someone asks here, what is the name of the commune mentioned by Mario? What's the name of that commune? The community work is essential. Many Aboriginal peoples retain that community work in Mexico. Well, I think that this would be all the questions. Yes, well, there is one more over here. Last question. Greetings, thank you for this conversation. I wanted to share the concern on the influence that the state has on the tutelage of the communal and society building, which is at odds with the socialism that is being built. And the popular power without exerting 
popular power is a disaster. Well, dear professors, now I'll give you the floor for you to answer to all the questions. I'm sorry if I didn't classify them. Thank you. You have the floor. Well, I would like to start, um, even if I don't have a specific order, because there are some questions that are mixed up, right? But I think it is very relevant to start uh, by the last question on the tutelage of the state over the creation of communes and uh, over the activities of uh, the communes activities that are aimed at creating the popular communes. In the long march towards a commu communal society, we explain this process, but if there is another book that will complement what we have said so far, which is named, what is the name, what was the name? Yes, the Fragua al Bravo Pueblo. Uh, excuse the interruption. There was one last question uh, through Facebook, and I apologize. They asked, what would be the main mistakes made in Latin America in the construction of people, people's power? Excuse me for interrupting. Here we are. Everything is okay. Yes, but we cannot see. I'm sorry. Okay. It's back. It's back. Thank you. It's back. So here we have this book on about La Fragua del Bravo Pueblo, the struggle of the courageous people. Yes, thank you. I have been sharing some of the titles of your books through the chat box. The one on Rentier Society Towards the Construction of a Communal Society. Yes, indeed, there are many books that we have published. Ever since the Chavez arrived, we have been publishing a lot about communes. When we started, working in the archaeology field, we became aware of many of the concepts that uh, I was explaining at the beginning, the, the communal experiences of the different states that we visited all throughout the country. So there were differences among the communes, but also very interesting things. For instance, they explained how the independence war occurred in Carabobo and not in other places of our country. Or we found an explanation of the many things that happened in the past. Uh, historical events. So with all this information that we gathered, we wrote nine books on communal matters. And all, how all these experiences uh, have uh, shed some light on the communal life. But there is one book that I wrote, which is called Existence and Participation. I would like to show you the book and uh, the Zaga of the Venezuelan people. In this book, there is a chapter devoted to the problem. I'm, I'm trying to find the book over here. Well, I will show the book later. Anyway, in that book called Resistance and Participation, the Venezuelan people Zaga, we try to describe why popular power was subjected up till the arrival of Chavez, why does popular power had been suppressed 
And the conclusion that uh, we have drawn is that there are examples of governments or of groups that were leading the country that were not based as in the process that started after the, the overthrowing of the dictatorship Here, here I am showing you in one of the one of the books. Yes, that book you are talking about. Yes, thank you. Well, in that book we have described what are the different kinds of resistance and participation, how the Venezuelan people participated in this historical process, and I have described a characterization of the ways of participation. And I have come to the conclusion that there were three main types of participation. And one of them is it's particularly interesting in terms of historical point of view. It is the participation in which that participation is not subjected to the state's influence, but there is a self, a true self-management of popular power. But since popular power is being structured ever since the arrival of Chavez, because by the way, uh, before Chavez, we didn't have such a popular organization. Each social leader or each popular leader was killed or was harassed. That was what we used to have in the past. But after Chavez's arrival, we start to see things differently. And mind you, we have not yet reached the, the final objective, the ultimate objective. Actually, yesterday, I watched a program, TV program with President Maduro, who was talking to communers, and he mentioned that people's power needed to be autonomous. People's power doesn't need to depend or rely on the state or to rely on what a different body is deciding on the communes. You know, that they need to be fully autonomous. They need to practice self-governance. They need to get organized in such a way where everything is being created and conceived from the commune's ranks through the proper consultation of the several groups that exist in the commune. So as long as there is some kind of control of the state, if the state is pointing out the objective, there is no real people's power. The state cannot tell people what they are needs are. The needs are recognized by the communers who are organized in assemblies through popular participation in the territory they are occupying, so on and so forth. If these communes are under the authority of the government, of course, they will not really achieve people's power and they will not be able to create a confederation of communes. So I think that, uh, of course, there needs to be a state, not under the bourgeoisie terms or bourgeoisie notion of what a state is. There needs to be a different social organization than the one that exists today. I think that the state controls over the commune, well, needs to be limited. It is not because they are granting resources that they are going to have a control on the ideology. In this book on resistance, I try to explain to communers that they need to be autonomous, that they need to seek for ways to, to conduct their administrative processes without an excessive reliance on the state. They need to make their own decisions so to achieve real popular power. 
and to not allow a too large participation of the state in their domestic affairs. That is my perception. I have a digital copy of this book and I could forward it to you if you're interested. But anyway, with the, some groups with whom I have been talking, some uh, communes located in Lara, Falcón, Cojedes, Portuguesa. Well, I have realized that uh, in these regions, the communal activities have started very early on. And it is a notion that has been handled for decades, centuries. So I understand the reason why it is precisely in these locations where we have the most amount of uh, uh, communes in Lara, Falcón, Cojedes, states. In Copesola also, with this a very big commune, which has no control of the state. In the Barinas estate, there are also other communes and up to the eastern part of Venezuela as well. So I believe that uh, communes need to be autonomous as long as they are under the control of the state, they will not be different from what we used to have in the past. This is the reason why they need to be autonomous. The decisions being made within the communes are decisions that need to be made by consensus of all the members of the communes, of course, and also with the, the participation of the organizations that are also part of the government, the, a, a government that is not yet a commun, communal government. So there needs to be some kind of dialogue and understanding to the communal organization is the one who is going to become a popular unitary social structure as as said by garcia linero in his book the central commune i don't know if mario would like to add something according to your opinion what have been the most important mistakes being committed in latin america for the construction of the people's power well, if we're going to talk about mistakes, I would like to say that uh, we have not yet uh, created a full people's power. If we look at the political development of countries such as Brazil, Argentina, and Ecuador, There has been a dismantling of the progressive movements by the right wing. And this is due to the fact that uh, the people's power was not recognized and that the political power remains in the hands of uh, a few uh, group of people who even though they had good intentions, did not uh, practice a respectful um, attitude towards the popular sectors. So the idea was to dismantle those progressive movements. I would like to, the, to add that uh, there are some historical antecedents why national bourgeoisie, national middle classes, why 
they do not think that the popular sectors have anything good. I've worked in Argentina. However, I have I am no expert. I'm I am expert. I'm no expert whatsoever in Argentina. I'm just a Venezuelan interested in what is going on in Venezuela. However, I could say that in my the limited trips to Argentina, I remember an expression that I used to hear here in, in Venezuela regarding the aboriginals and the original population. They were derogatory comments. They despised the gauchos, ignorant. And justifying campaigns against those original populations. And same thing in other countries. They say, oh, you know, these guys, they do not want to leave poverty. They like the easy life. Those are the general comments. There is a tradition of continuous despite against uh, those people because they are always poor. I've been to Peru, Chile, Ecuador, Bolivia, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, many times, and Colombia is, is, is horrible. And I think it's a lack of respect vis-a-vis -vis those people. And this is a result of something that happened in the region to disqualify, to insult those people. And uh, we have several expressions in Latin America when you see how Peru or how Europeans deal with our region in South America. It's different from the attitude towards the Pacific area. And Mario has written about that, explaining why Those, those two areas were approached by capitalism in a differentiated way. So those people who had problem with the, their underdevelopment, and I don't like to use that term, but well, you know, I recognize that uh, uh, there was no a will to allow the popular sector to develop. Chavez, however, on the contrary, considered those people like himself. I believe you. I believe in you. I believe you can able to. You're able to do this and that. That approach based on respect and love. I have a book on Chavez and love that uh, speaks about that. Chavez loves his people and that's why the people love him back. And he is able to create this extraordinary language, what he said about uh, what we have is not uh, only love, what I have is frenzy vis-a-vis -vis you. So he considered an equal 
And he told the people, I cannot organize you. You have to organize yourself. He trusted the capacity of the people to organize. And he asked them to analyze things. And there was a continuous dictum, a continuous phrase he used to use. Wait, reflect upon this first. He never said, you are wrong. He said, no, no, reflect upon this. Think about this. And that was essential because those organizations that then transformed into communal cities and communal council, they held sessions to reflect upon this. I will be sharing with comuneros, helping them in the reflection process. If you don't give the people the possibility to reflect, but if you keep on the language of uh, people are useless, they are lazy, they just want to have a handout. If you continue repeating that, they become an obstacle to the development of the people. And in closing, there's something else I would like to add. I remember a show by Chavez and a lo presidente, a theoretical a lo presidente program. And then Chavez said, not only you have to reflect and think, but you have to be able to use power As Gramsci said, leaders resulting from the group, they are recognized by the group, not because he does many things, but because they share the same culture, the same world vision, mutual respect, although they are different. So he said, Chavez said, you have to be people's power, but not because I tell you, not because that is a title, but you have to be able to use power. Then when I say I behave in this fashion, it's because you can and you have the power to do that and you are responsible of what you're doing. I saw that debate with a group of comuneros and Chavez. A large group that then took up the popular power concept. And once he said, when he said this phrase, to take power and to use it. So someone asked him, how can we use power if there, if there is a law that says this, and there are officials who said this. Well, he said, you need to become lawmakers. You need to produce the law that gives you the power, that empower you. Perhaps this might be an illusion, but I think that in Venezuela we have members of the people's power who are empowered and they are generating new laws. We've been asked to analyze the new law on communal cities. And that law was drafted by them. It was not drafted by a delegate. It was drafted by a collective and that collective was able to draft this new law on communal cities. So I don't know what are the obstacles for constructing 
um, communal uh, power elsewhere, but I know there are obstacles in other uh, parts of the, the region. There is another question of the comuneros from Mérida. They ask a question. Well, in Colombia, Peru, we have similar movements. There was an insurrection of comuneros against the colonial power. This is very important. especially if we think about the future. As Iraida said, we went to China because we were anthropologists and we had a lot of contact with the communal areas in the Lara state. And there we found all the ancient communal structures, collective structures. And in those areas, the guerrilla movement were acting against the Acción Democrática government. And that was their ideological base. We therefore contributed in the creation of a, a political vision of the armed struggle, enabling many of these combatants to join the communal life of those territories where they uh, existed. Well, we met because I was a university professor. She was not my student, but uh, we met in a, in a dig of a cemetery, indigenous cemetery, and more than half a century have uh, elapsed, more than 57 years ago. We met in an archaeological fieldwork. As the person from China asked, we started to work. And uh, Mario had more experience. He had visited other regions. But uh, we started to work together since. And uh, we can say, and we can boast that thanks to that work and the work of our students, we have been able to understand why some regions of the country, especially Lara, Umocaro, etc., It is there where we find, uh, we used to find the most uh, guerrilla movement during the Fourth Republic. Well, it was linked to the fact that the peasant populations or the non-urban populations in that region at that time were far more sensitive and used to cooperate more with the left movement and the guerrilla. Most of the guerrilla people survived because of this connection with these local communities. And uh, in our research, we discovered 
that uh, the people at the time in those regions were more closer to the guerrilla movement. And very responsive. I, we met uh, Lee Rodriguez Jaraque, this great Venezuelan, former guerrilla man and former commander of the guerrilla in that area. And we talked a lot about this topic as a result of his book, Before I Forget. In the case of Guayana, Guayana has been a region that uh, has been usually forgotten and abandoned. The books we published in 2005, the ages of Guyana, archaeology of a chimera and prefaced by Luis Vito Garcia. There we discuss indigenous population and the Capuchin Catalan missions until 1817. And today that book has become very important. We have just finished the work on Carabobo, from Guyana to Carabobo. People sometimes do not understand or ignore how come that is in Guyana that we they organized the Angostura Congress. And it is based on Angostura that uh, a military and political campaign started towards Carabobo that ended with the Spanish Empire. It is because Guyana, Guayana, was a region with the large economic development in the 18th and 19th centuries with the Capuchin communities, the most advanced capitalist S attempt at that time, because that was an agro-industrial society that has industrialized iron ore, gold, and metallurgy in general, and they had uh, accumulated a lot of uh, material goods like uh, herds of uh, horse, cocoa, tobacco, shoe manufacturing, and they used to export products to Catalonia in Spain. So the Republic was able to stabilize in 1817 and to have a base to liberate Venezuela and Colombia and the rest of Latin America is because Guayana was able to supply the economic uh, livelihood for that process to occur and there were a whistle required. So no one understand why the liberator proclaimed to add an eighth star on the flag. And that never occurred until Commander Chavez did. Many people did not understand that why we had to add another star to our flag. The fact is that Guayana was the fundamental region to consolidate the independence of Venezuela. I'd like to add those interested in our history, we can be in touch and we can send you the ebook. Because I would like to add the following. When we talk about Guayana, we are not referring only to the Bolivar state. We are also including the today the territory that we are claiming, the Esequibo, because when Mario says Guayana financed Carabobo, 
and the independence war and the independence battle, he doesn't refer to Guayana only, but the Guyanese population. Why, some people say, why this is not mentioned? Well, because those who struggled for independence and made possible that the wealth extracted, the wealth was not extracted by the missionaries, but the indigenous people, the Carib, the Guyanese indigenous people encompassing the border of the Esequibo up until the middle Orinoco. So the Guyanese indigenous people and not the missionary. Of course, we need to mention PR and those who fought for independence, but uh, it was the great Carib revolt that occurred and the leaders of those movements where another Indian chief, I don't remember his name now, but uh, there are Guyanese names. They say, how come you never name anyone important from that region? Archaeologists know that without Guyana and without the Guyanese people, they would have in uh, independence, but even in Colombia, because it was Guyana that financed the campaign for the Boyacá battle to take place. Therefore, we need to stress the importance and the link between the past and the pre-Colombian period independence because those indigenous population produced that wealth that led to independence. And you need to understand how marvelous that process was. The uh, ovens used to produce iron, to produce pottery, crockery, etc. So Guyana is mentioned by us in many occasions. And so its role has been forgotten by the Venezuelan historiography. Let's move forward. Those talking about paper and hot paper in Trujillo My father was from Trujillo and I learned to eat hot pepper. Venezuela, we use extensively the hot pepper and the pepper. I'm going to show you very briefly some the tools, iron tools produced in the Capuchin missions in the Guyana, in the Guayana region. It's very varied, the number of tools manufactured in that region by the Capuchin missions. The cannonballs, spades, spears, many iron tools. So going back to the green paper, hot paper, 
¿Cuál fue la ayuda de los venezolanos a los invasores? Based on that question, I would like to um, connect this with the assistance provided to the Spaniards by the local populations. The Spaniards arrived in Venezuela. They invade Venezuela. They invade the territory and they met people they didn't know. Very strange people. The, the star manufacturing legends that uh, those people had two heads. And uh, the snakes could uh, eat people alive, etc. A lot of fantasies. The invaders ignored, they didn't know the place. They entered through the Carib routes, through the Sucre state. And from there, they went along the coastline, but uh, they didn't know what to eat. Then when they reach an indigenous settlement, they didn't know where they should go and, and they massacred those hamlets. So they used to, used to eat the children because they didn't know what to eat. So it was thanks to the assistance of the indigenous populations that they learned where were the roots to take and what type of food they could eat, what they could grow, and what type of animals they could eat, etc. But the most important assistance they provided them was the assistance provided by a group. At that time, we had two main ethnic, ethnic groups, the Caribs. The Caribs who had penetrated Venezuela through the south, through the Black River, through the Caroni River, and up to the Orinoco River, and settled in all the Guayana region. Caribes were settlers of those regions. And there was another group, the Arawako group, who also came in to Venezuela through the eastern part, and then they moved on to the western part, to Huarico region, and uh, they also covered the Piedemonte Andino region. So they settled finally in Trujillo, Lara, and Falcón. And it was back then when the campaign to conquest Caracas was uh, unleashed. By Francisco de Fajardo. Invaders that entered through the coast, they settled in Caracas, in the, in the northern central zone. And there was it was in this zone where there were many indigenous from the Caribbean, Caribe ethnic group. Invaders tried to take Caracas thanks to the expeditions financed by Europeans that were located in Margarita Island, but they were not successful. They could not occupy Caracas. They could not hold Caracas because at the very first attempt, the Caribbean or the Caribbean's indigenous population fought back and repelled them. But those who came through Lara and Falcón through the eastern part of the country, 
those invaders asked the Arawakos indigenous to form an army that will accompany the conquerors. And that army that knew very well the roots, that knew what they could eat, and that 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 group that was pretty familiar with uh, the Caribbean's uh, ethnic groups, well, they were their enemies actually. So the Arawakos group accompanied also Diego de Lozada, who was a conqueror who wanted to seize Caracas. And thanks to the help of the Arawakos, the conquerors, the invaders were successful in seizing Caracas and they founded the city. But there's a different story of how the city of Caracas was founded and how Losadas uh, could uh, finally found uh, the capital city. Of course, there, the invaders received uh, help from the uh, Arawakos ethnic groups. We have another book that we wrote on Caracas, which is called uh, The Water and the Power. And in this book, we looked at the historical events that led to the foundation of Caracas. So all this story I have just told you about the Arawakos is contained here in this book. The Arawakos ethnic group, as well as the Caribes ethnic group, but they, they did not disappear. They were actually um, the first settlers of uh, the region that is today called Caracas. And there are other books also that we have written on that uh, matter, on the urban process as well. Now, this book, The Water and the Power, is named like that because once the invaders came to Caracas, they realized that there was a problem with water, with water provision. And uh, actually, we still have problems with water today. Anyway, as you know, in all the conquering process, they uh, get hold of all natural resources, such as water in this case. And the book is on that story. Okay, let's go back to the questions. How many questions, right? I yes, I talked about arepa, but there are other other dishes, other food. Could you please, could you like to take the floor? Come on. Well, okay, I, I'll explain it. I explained uh, or I told you the story about the arepa because this is a discussion that we have with. Uh, our brothers from Colombia, they say they invented the arepa, but it is not like that, it's not true. Arepa comes from a Caribe expression, the aripo. Aripo is the tool we used to make arepas. So aripo is a Caribe creation. It's like a pan, like a, a pan where you cook that uh, that uh, the arepa. They use pottery in order to to make these pans. So there were pans or ceremonial pans that had the different um, pictures or descriptions and in those tools they used to cook arepas right and we can see the form the shape of the arepa of, of that bread being uh, drawn in some of the those, um, tools but there was not there were not only arepas and aripo in fact the caribes were the creators of a, a typical dish that uh, spread all over the eastern part of South America, which is uh, the cassava, cassava, the cassava bread, which is made out of manioc. 
they made a flower made of manioc and they made a big cassava uh, bread. So they also used aripos in order to make this cassava. And it was a substitute for, for bread. It is still um, consumed in today's life. Mario published a book on manioc and corn, and he describes in that book how corn was processed in Venezuela and how manioc was also processed to make a food. So the two, these two culinary um, customs have been domesticated in this region. They are also present in the northern part of uh, Lara. And as I said uh, earlier, there were guerrilla members of uh, Lara in, in this region. And they used a, a small species of corn that was also found in the northern part of Colombia and in the coast, Atlantic coast. So Venezuela was a secondary domestication center for processing this uh, small corn. There were also other species in the Apure state where they domesticated different ways of uh, corn. And in the case of manioc, of course, all the eastern part of Venezuela up to the coast used to uh, manioc made uh, cassava and uh, these populations were the ones who emigrated to the minor Antilles and to the to the islands and uh, you can see how they also in these islands uh, eat cassava and they even got up to the southern part of the Florida the Florida in the United States So this is how the Arawakas processed corn and processed manioc. Actually, there is a Cuban researcher that wrote uh, on this subject, and he said in one of his books that uh, the modern homeland of the Antilles is uh, in Venezuela. So in the Orinoco River, where those groups came from Brazil and occupied all the Orinoco uh, region, the Guyana region, all of the eastern states, and they got up to the coast and then go to the islands of the Caribbean, and then they got to, to the Florida, Florida in the United States. They all I made uh, cassava bread and uh, ate corn. So, of course, you can find uh, all this research in different uh, uh, bibliography on the matter, on the consumption of cassava and uh, on the, con the consumption of corn. So, yes, these are products that are very um, popular. When I went to Dominican Republic, I had the impression that I was like in Venezuela, that we had the same way of talking, of speaking, and uh, we had you know, the same spirit, a very joyful spirit. There are many things in common among our peoples. And in that region, and also, they also domesticated uh, uh, corn and cassava and, and manioc. Guyana and the uh, Netherlands, Guyana, they all produced manioc because they were sub centers of the domestication 
of the production of cassava of uh, manioc. And we have been many times to the Dominican Republic actually, and uh, Professor Malosius talked about us, talked about his research on the Perisaguara. Uh, this is a Perisaguara, is a vegetable that is per, very similar to what we can find here. And regarding the production of vegetables, well, we have a, a similar kind of uh, land and uh, production that we all, all grow in terms of uh, potatoes and other um, vegetables are pretty much the same. Very well. I am now going to give you the floor because I have been talking for a while now. So if you'd like to answer the question from Canada, what are the theories of the origin of the Amerindian population? Well, there is a, a theory that uh, the person who asked the question has mentioned the theory of Beringue. So far, it is uh, the most important theory, the most predominant theory of them all. But there are also evidence of other migration routes through the south uh, western part through the pacific coast through which peoples got to chile and to some regions of the central brazil there are indications of people who probably came from there's a trans-pacific migration but it is a theory that so far has not been demonstrated Yes, but uh, some other scientists say very surprising things. I share the thesis of the French researchers who did research in Brazil, and I think that uh, what they argue is uh, quite plausible. That they came through the north and they uh, got to the south, and, and they have uh, d data, very Asian data available. But uh, not only that, when we are trying to explain how the Americas were populated, there are many archaeologists and researchers that uh, tend to use uh, data from the present going back to the past. But uh, in my personal opinion, I believe that um, all these uh, thesis, well, yes, some of the populations came through the south, through Argentina, and they found cemeteries and grave, uh, graves with uh, um, some evidence of the penetration of the populations. But there are other works uh, from Ecuador, mainly, that uh, are studying the presence of uh, these groups, the settlers that took place very early on, I would say 6,000 years ago in the region of Guaya, Guaya, where there were very early settlers and uh, Dr. Mayers, one of the researchers of this zone, and Dr. Clifford Edwards, that I can see in one photograph over here, I saw with my own eyes this material, and it is identical to the material that was shown to us by Dr. Mayers and Ayers in Washington, when in their excavations, uh, of uh, the population of Yomong in the culture Yomong in Japan. So it would not be surprising that uh, there were trans-oceanic migrations because, well, they actually demonstrated that because uh, it wouldn't be possible to have identical culinary customs in different regions while they were under occupation 
for instance, the Yomond in Japan, and the identical dish being produced also in the Ecuadorian coast. There has to be a connection there. And there are possibilities that the origin of the Amerindian populations in the Americas uh, are based on different theses and different possibilities, not only through the Bering Strait, which is the most commonly accepted theory. I'm sure that there should have been other ways of penetration as well. Someone asked how, how we met, how Maria and I met. You already mentioned that. Well, I was studying my uh, senior year and uh, at the college, and I was uh, making a research on Hispanic cemeteries. And there was a professor, Mario Sanoja, who was uh, doing some excavations in the Essequibo region in Guadalupe. And uh, I talked to the professor and uh, I asked him if I could participate in the excavation team. And well, the rest is, is history. And I was incorporated to the team. And this was 57 years ago. Well, and uh, it was thanks to archaeology that we got to know each other, we got to meet. And another question was, what kind of interaction there is we had when we visited uh, the different communities of populations settled in the inner cities when we were making our doing our research? Well, it's difficult to say, but because we not only were doing research, we were also working with the communities. It was the time of the guerrilla, and we were also participating in that guerrilla process somehow. But we were comrades, you know, we were very close and we knew each other pretty well. It was a very close interaction indeed. Yes, I would add something. As uh, you know, as it is frequently the case uh, when someone, a foreigner, visits a, uh, a town, a small village or rural age, a, a zone, and uh, you can find very caring and loving people. The poorer they are, the more caring people they are. And when we uh, got to these places, uh, we were very well welcomed. They offered their help. They were very kind to us. And not only we were doing some political uh, work, we wanted to help them, providing them with the resources to the to villages that received very little. These were people who were living in very far distant towns. They were kind of abandoned by the state. There were very few people leaving those villages. And we established a very nice and close relationship. I particularly remember at dawn uh, the conversations that we had, and also conversations with the, the elderly, with the children, uh, the stories they used to tell us. You know that in Venezuela there is a, there is a custom, the custom of telling stories, and there is always one person who is an expert on telling stories. And they used to tell us stories that were very nice and amusing. And we also told them about our experience. So it was a very intense uh, experience, a very joyful, very nice. Uh, um, yes. This is what I would say about that. But there are so many questions. Okay. There is one question on 23 de Enero. 
on the name of the 23rd de enero. The community's named Alexis Vive. Alexis is alive. And also Panal 2021. That is the name of that commune. And in that commune, we gave a few conferences. We participated in a TV uh, show. They explained to us what they were doing. If uh, they asked us for advice, we gave them advice. And we had a very close relationship with the organizers of the commune. And we met uh, people that uh, we used to know in the past. And, you know, it was a very great, it, it was a very nice experience. I felt very happy indeed because they always uh, said every time we participated in the meeting, you know, there was this conception that if you went to this part of the city in 23 de Enero, it's not safe. There is there, it's not a safe part of the city. But when we went there, we realized that this was not the case. It was on the contrary. Uh, it was a very pleasant uh, experience. And every time they invited us, they tried to, to be there. Sometimes we couldn't uh, make it because we were uh, teaching seminars in Spain and in other countries, and we couldn't uh, participate as frequently as we wanted to visit that commune. But uh, anyway, we had a wonderful relationship with them. Uh, the domestication centers of corn. I think I have already answered that question because there is one question over here. So uh, if there are more questions. Yes, there was one question about the, those uh, thinkers, researchers that have had an influence on your work. I'll give you the floor. Yes, in Venezuela, Federico Ruiz Figueroa, Olmo Quintero, Doc Massa Zavala. These are some of the researchers that have had influence on our, on, on our work. Asida Farias. Umil Grau, an extraordinary man indeed. And internationally speaking, we have Gramsci, of course. I, uh, I have a profound admiration for Gramsci and for Mizarros, who I also admire very much. I read him frequently. Marx and Mao, of course, who are very important uh, thinkers. And there is a group of uh, Soviet intellectuals because uh, I had a, a master under the direction of Brito Figueroa with uh, historians from the uh, Soviet Union, from uh, the Academy of Science of the uh, Soviet Union. I do not remember their names, but I will be, uh, I would like to pay tribute to these scientists who told us about a world that was behind the iron curtain, the iron wall, and we had no or, or very little information about that. So we are very grateful uh, for all the information they shared back then. I'm also very interested in the work being done by a group of Latin American uh, researchers that were was created in the 80s. 
Latin American researchers in anthropology and history and archaeology. And uh, this group of researchers tries to understand the historical processes that took place in Latin America. And I remember that uh, we held meetings with the researchers in Mexico in a population named Waspetec. And this is the reason why we were called the Waspetec group, actually. And that Waspetec group was made up by Maros Magnolo from the Dominican Republic and Gulen from Colombia. And also that is from Mexico. Diaz Polanco uh, from Mexico. Bandrecandren from Mexico. The vast majority were from Mexico, actually. Luis, Luis Vegas from Peru. Mario and I from Venezuela and from Chile. Montaner from Chile. Heredia from Brazil and Argentina. Darcy Ribeiro from Brazil. So these were Latin American intellectuals and also one from Cordoba from Argentina, right? Well, I, I don't remember, but let me finish up the idea because I think that we need to round up. I'm about to, to finish. So we started proposing collective projects based on our experiences with the left wing um, political affinity. And the idea was to produce books, materials, to give uh, conferences. Uh, apparently, there are some technical problems with their transmission. Yes, well, with the participation of different researchers. And we did it. We did publish many books, indeed. And uh, yes, we accomplished the task. Well, I don't know if uh, there is something else that we would like to say. Thank you very much. And indeed, thank you, Professor Iraida, Professor Mario. It has been an honor. It has been a pleasure. And I am uh, sure that for all of us, it has been a very pleasant conversation. Very nice to, to listen to you, to listen to your stories. And I believe that the work that you have been doing is uh, remarkable. It's uh, essential work to understand Venezuela and the different process of social construction. The thesis on which you have been working about the construction of a communal society or a, a communal socialism from the Venezuelan experience is a fundamental contribution for the region. And as I said before, it is very relevant today since we are celebrating the anniversary of the Paris, the Paris Commune. So it is all it's very uh, interesting and the contribution is uh, valuable. I would like to thank all of those who have been following me uh, from China, it is midnight in China, so thank you very much for following us. You have always been very loyal to these meetings that have been accompanying us. Uh, also, I would like to thank people from Colombia, for Argentina, and all the other countries who have been following us. And to thank the interpreters, to thank uh, Claudia, to thank, thank Maria, Sanmei, and this is a common 
effort, a teamwork between our movements, the Lean Nam University for Sustainability, the Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity, the Ecotechnological Center Green Ground from China, and also ARENA, the Regional Association from Asia. I don't know if Jade or Kinshe, would you like to add something, some closing remarks for today? Um, we would like to thank uh, two professors because uh, we understand more your, uh, uh, not only your work, but also your passionate uh, to, towards a better world, towards a communal society. And uh, we think that you are indeed what Granchi said, uh, organic intellectuals in Venezuela, in today Venezuela. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Welcome. Sí, yo, yo creo que además, eh, sin duda, son, no solo son intelectuales orgánicos, sino además... Yes, de... they are not only organic intellectuals. They are a great contribution to the Venezuelan revolution and to the critical thinking in Latin America. So thank you very much to both professors. Thank you indeed. And uh, we have been sharing some of the links in the chat box of the many books that have been mentioned by the professors. We shared the PDD version of a couple of them, but I, I am sure that uh, uh, it will be possible to share later on all other links, all the other books. This is a uh, seminar that is uh, available in the Alba TV network and also in the Global University for Sustainability website and our Movement Continental Platform website. So all the text and the books will be shared through those channels. And the purpose of this seminar or the upcoming session is to make a publication with all the topics that have been studied. And uh, we will have two versions, one version in Spanish and another version in English and another in Chinese. And of course, we will have a contribution made today by Professor Mario Agdaida in this publication. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation. Very honored. Thank you. Well, we say goodbye with the motto, commune or nothing.